Yeah. It's warm in here. Yeah. It's warm in here, right? I saw even the folks from Hope Church were dancing this morning. Oh, we have a lot of fun. We do have a lot of fun. We, uh, I decided to change my sermon topic, by the way. I'm going to preach that sermon, Love and Power, next Sunday when the children's choir can sing with us, and we're going to do that as planned with the children's story and all of that. So I decided that I was going to preach on Life is Good. So that's my topic this morning. Life is Good. I mean, what a week. What a week it has been. So much happening around the world and right here in our little world in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I wonder if there are people who are watching on live stream or, or clapping and dancing also in their, in their living rooms, computer rooms, offices. I hope pajamas. so. What's that? And in their pajamas. In their pajamas on their iPads or whatever. <laughs> That's not starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> what were you thinking getting up and getting out here this morning? What a week it's been. Now, life is full of tests and full of limitations. Some tests and limitations are environmental. Some are cultural. Some are biological. Some we put upon ourselves. Some are nonsense. Tests such as, how far will I go to make money? What am I willing to do to save my marriage? What will I do to get a job, to get elected, to stay healthy? Am I capable of getting a date? Am I able to be a good friend? Can I truly love anybody? Can I raise a child? really do it well? Can I face this disease, this operation, this loss? Can I take responsibility for the mistake I made or the decision I made? This life is full of tests. Can I accept my children for who they are? Am I good-looking enough, tall enough, free-spirited enough? Can I live a few more years? Can I die? I mean, do it well, with some dignity left. We all grapple with some of these questions. I know I do. We all wrestle with our limitations. We try to decide which ones are real and which ones we can overcome. Right? This week, as I've been sitting, thinking about the limitations and the obstacles that I've had just with the snow and the ice and the inability to get to work or to get out of the house, right? 14 inches of snow. Now, that's significant, but in Chicago, where I'm from, It's not that big a deal, right? So what is an obstacle and a limitation in one place is just a minor inconvenience in another place. Just like what is an obstacle and a limitation in one life may be just a minor obstacle in someone else's life. And of course, sitting at home, feeling challenged by the snow. We've all been watching the revolution taking place in Egypt on our television screens and our computer screens. A revolution happening in our times, in our midst, you know, started by young people on their computers. It's amazing. The scenes have been incredible if you've seen them. Protesters defying tear gas attacks by the police to mount a bridge for freedom in Cairo. Christians creating a wall of safety around their Muslim Countrymen and women, as they did their daily prayers in Liberty Square, incredible. There have been scenes of violent counter-protesters 
riding into the crowds of peaceful protesters on camels and horses, carrying whips and bats and kitchen knives. Unbelievable scenes. Others throwing rocks and throwing flaming gasoline bombs off of the roofs of buildings onto the peaceful protesters in the crowd. American reporters and reporters from other countries being beaten and arrested in the streets. And this time, it is the Egyptians and not the Jews. And it's Hosni Mubarak and not the Pharaoh of Exodus. But it's the same chant, a chant of the same flavor to the leader of Egypt, let my people go. Let my people go. But in this case, it's let your people go. It's an age-old story of ordinary people breaking free of tyranny and oppression and rising up to overcome obstacles and limits that seemed insurmountable. The week before was a very somber week for me and many others when we heard about the Ugandan activist David Cato who was murdered in his home for the simple reason that he's gay and he chose not to settle for the culture of violence and oppression in Uganda, where he's from. His name and his photo, along with a hundred other people, Ugandans, suspected of being gay in their country, were published in the Ugandan newspaper under the heading, Hang Them. Now, instead of cowering and running away, David Cato sued the newspaper to stop invading people's privacy and inciting violence against them. Now the newspaper publisher said after David Cato was murdered in his own home that he did not mean for neighbors to beat and kill their neighbors. He was advocating that the government do it. Some consolation. You may remember that it was on the first Sunday of February, exactly a year ago today, that I stood in this pulpit before this congregation and said that I had been, it had been requested of me to go to Uganda, to Kampala, for a conference to speak in support of both our partner church there and the gay and lesbian community of Uganda who were being attacked by their own government. And I said that I was going to go. And I actually used a number of excerpts from that sermon from a year ago in the, the piece that I wrote this week that was published by the Huffington Post. If you haven't seen it, I hope you'll take a moment to look at it in honor of David Cato, who was, who was martyred and murdered. And I, and I dearly hope and I pray that, that no one else gets killed, and certainly especially my colleague and our partner church minister, Reverend Mark Kiimba, who is standing up right beside David Cato in the same way for the same reasons to stop this violence and, and persecution in that nation. Now all of these events have got me thinking about obstacles and limitations in our own lives. This morning I want to share the stories of two people who I, I find very inspiring. There's so many stories, but there's two that I wanted to share with you this morning. Do you remember George Dawson? George Dawson, at the age of 98, he began learning to read. Dawson was an African American, and he always wanted to read. But at the age of 16, he figured he probably had missed his chance. He started working on his family farm in Texas at the age of 8. His, his grandparents were former slaves who were among the fortunate who actually received 40 acres and a mule after emancipation. By his 12th birthday, his parents needed to rent him out to a white family for $1.50 a month in order to put food on the table for the rest of George's siblings. It was at a time when one less mouth to feed and a little extra income really helped. Being born in 1898, and celebrating his 100th birthday in the year 2000, or 102nd birthday in the year 2000, meant that George had lived in three centuries. It also meant that he was born shortly after the 1896 Supreme Court decision Plessy versus Ferguson, 
which legitimized Jim Crow segregation in this nation. The realities of race were taught to him early when, at the age of 10, he watched his friend, 17-year-old friend, being lynched in the center of town on trumped-up charges of rape that were later discredited. On his way home, his father tried to wipe away George's tears as well as the hate that he saw welling up inside his son. This was the first of many talks that they would have about how to get along as a black person in America. George learned which drinking fountains and bathrooms he could use and which he could not. He learned what tone to use when addressing white folks and where to sit on the back of the train. For more than 80 years, George Dawson worked in a, I'm sorry, for, yeah, for more than 80 years, he worked in a sawmill, he built levees on the Mississippi River, he drove spikes for the first railroads in East Texas, he broke wild horses, he swept floors, he cleaned for white people, and for 25 years he ran the machines that pasteurized milk at a dairy farm. He once lost the chance at a promotion at the dairy farm because he did not know how to write his own name. At one point, he played semi-pro baseball in the Negro League, and he spent 10 years traveling throughout North America by rail. Sometimes he had a ticket, and other times he just jumped on boxcars. It's amazing when you live to be over 100, there's a lot that you can do. He outlived four wives, and he personally cared for each one as they died. He fathered seven children, but he never learned to read. Until one day at the age of 98, when a young man came to his door recruiting people for the adult basic education classes at the local high school. And according to an article in the Seattle Star-Telegram, when the young man came to his door, George said, I've been alone for 10 years. I'm tired of fishing. I'm going to learn to read. A few, years late, a few days later, George waited outside a classroom 103, and the teacher looked at him. He stood barely five feet tall. His skin was wrinkled. His hair was white. His blue eyes said he was serious. You ever go to school, the teacher asked. Not a day. Not a day? Never had a chance. You know the alphabet? No, son. The teacher began with six letters, but the old man interrupted. No, son, I want to see them all. I want to put them together. George learned his ABCs in a day and a half. The teacher moved on to phonics, breaking words into pieces and sounding out their parts. No, son, I want to say something that makes sense. At the age of 102, George was studying as a full-time student and received his GED. He hardly missed a day of class except for an occasional funeral. When asked if he was going to take a break, he replied, no way, I still got so much ahead of me to learn. Clearly, George did not want to squander the life that was so miraculously given, even and up till the end. Lord knows that he had many obstacles put in his path. He's lived through inhumanity and loss and stolen possibilities without losing his sense of hope and gratitude for life and without compromising his personal integrity. That's why I want to share his story this morning. He may not have gone to school, but he's been tested by life's inequities, uncertainties, and fears. He's been tested long before he went back to school. In a world of heartless discrimination, he regularly had to decide between his pride and his life. Imagine that. How far would he go to make money to protect his family to avoid a scene. Life is full of tests. Life is full of limitations. 
and obstacles for every one of us. Some are cultural, some are biological, and others we put upon ourselves. The second story on this theme that I want to share is from one of my favorite contemporary writers, Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, a Jewish woman who tells about when she was 16 years old, she went to sleep one night in her college dormitory room, and she woke up six months later in the hospital. She has Crohn's disease, a mass and massive intestinal bleeding put her in a coma. The doctor said that if she ever did come out of the coma, she'd forever be an invalid and be severely limited by a disease that at the time they didn't know very much about. They did not expect her to live past the age of 40. If she woke up, going back to college was not even an option. But six months later, when she finally woke up and she understood what was happening, Rachel had other plans. She wanted to be a doctor. She admits that as a spoiled only child, she was used to getting her way. Rachel and her father had a number of heated arguments in the hospital. And when she finally told him that she was going back to school regardless of what the doctor said, he said, well, I'm not paying for it. That's when her mother, who was, although she was a professional woman, lived in a different era, and she never disagreed or challenged her husband before. She said, then I'll pay for it. Turns out that Rachel's mother had been saving money in a secret bank account for years. And she told Rachel that she'd give her the money, all of it, for her tuition. Within 24 hours, against the doctor's advice, Rachel's mom signed her out of the hospital and flew her back to college. For six months, her mom stayed with her and cared for her and even pushed her to class in a wheelchair when she was too weak to walk. The next couple of years, they were terribly hard as Rachel dealt with being sick and often weak. The powerful drugs that she was on completely altered the way she looked. She lost 30 pounds. And eventually, Rachel found an inner strength that she did not know that she had. Years later, she asked her mom, weren't you afraid? Most parents would not have taken such risks with their child's life. I was terrified for you, her mother explained, but I was even more frightened for your dreams. If they died, this disease would have claimed you. If others had made the choices about your life, you would have always wondered whether you could have made it. You may have become bitter. There are so many ways to die, her mother told her. And the tears welled up in Rachel's eyes. And she asked her mom, what would have happened if I would have failed? Then you would have found out for yourself what was real and what was possible. And then perhaps in time, you would have come to accept it and to dream a new dream for your life based on what you were capable of. Now, her story reminds me that sometimes the limits that are put upon our lives heightens our appreciation for what's possible and what we do have. Right? But then there are other limits that are real. Obstacles that cannot be overcome. I realized back in high school, much to my disappointment, that at 5 foot 11, 180 pounds, I would never play for the NFL. <laughs> there would never be a Super Bowl ring on this hand. Right? Now, I will admit that I have busted through the limitation of 180 pounds. <laughs> Still no NFL contract. But other limits are what one of my mentors and great friends, Ken McLean, called established nonsense. Many limits that are placed upon women, on the physically challenged, on gay and lesbian people, on folks who live in poverty, 
are based on established nonsense. The limits placed on George Dawson and other people of color during the days of segregation and even sometimes up until today also fit into this category of established nonsense. In the book that Dawson co-wrote at the age of 100, he tells of one train excursion in the 30s in which landed him in Tulsa. And he and another black gentleman went to look for a place to eat. And George was surprised when the man who could read explained to him that the signs here in Tulsa read, No colored and no Indians. He'd never seen a sign that said no Indians before. And his companion explained that there are many Indians in Oklahoma and they ain't white either, he said. But there's one kind of limit that no one of us can escape. And that's mortality. The awareness that we will not live forever is the foundation of religion. And it's our mandate to fully appreciate every day and every moment of every day. And to use our precious lives to make some impact for good. At 98 years old, George Dawson started learning to read. For the last four years of his life, he was a scholar and an author. Even at age 102, people would constantly ask him if he thinks he'd ever marry again. And he'd say, I might, I might. When asked if he liked school, he says, every morning I get up and I wonder what I might learn today. You just never know. I'm so grateful to have the chance to go to school, he said. George Dawson's story and Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen's life are testaments to the fact that a fulfilled life is achievable even in the face of great adversity and obstacles. They show us how a person can remain hopeful even when life circumstances are stacked up against us. The protesters in Egypt and throughout the Middle East today and the activists who are daily risking their lives in Uganda and other parts of the world all remind us that change is possible but not without risks and challenges. But one person dares to dream and others also see that and dare to reach out for their own dreams. At whatever age, we inspire others. In this new year, what are you planning to do differently? I hope that you'll push through some of your own limits into possibilities in the face of whatever adversities might confront you, because you too will inspire others. You probably already are. What doors will you unlock that might otherwise remain closed for you and for others who will follow? Take time, even if you're snowed in, to savor and appreciate this life that has been so miraculously given and that won't last forever. Make it full and a worthwhile life, outlined as it must be, by hardships and limitations, because that's the nature of it all. May 2011 find in you a fullness of experience that absorbs both sorrow and joy, winter and spring, living and dying. Take heed of the words of a 102-year-old man named George Dawson who said, life is so good and it's only getting better. God bless you. And amen.